no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if but we, we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be light in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of our holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace of the 
Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. He showed them his hands and his side. 
Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today we are privileged to meditate upon the gospel reading which you heard read a moment ago from John, the 20th chapter. Listen now again to the first verses of that reading. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, first of all, greetings from the Indiana district, and I don't mean from that office that's there in Fort Wayne. I mean from the other congregations of the Indiana district, as I am privileged to come and to preach at various congregations, I give these same greetings. And the greetings are from the congregations where I have been, and now you're included when I go to the next congregation. Your greetings are going out to them. We have some 230 congregations in the Indiana district, which is the entire state of Indiana, and then also northern Kentucky. And we are walking together we are part of a synod, walking together in our understanding of the faith. This morning we get to meditate upon a most wondrous text, and I doubt you would want me to do this, but I could probably preach on this for several hours. There is so much in this text. Instead, I would have you consider the echo. Did you hear the echo? Jesus, on that Easter Sunday evening, came into the locked room where the disciples were, and he said, Peace be with you. And then again that evening, he said, Peace be with you. And then a week later, when Thomas was present, he echoed it again, Peace be with you. Now you hear the echo. It is for you and for me as well. Peace be with you. And how appropriate that it comes from the mouth of the long-awaited Messiah, the long-awaited Savior. For you see, throughout the Old Testament, he had been predicted to be the source of peace. Going back to Genesis, chapter 49, we see that Jacob blesses his 12 sons. And when it comes to Judah, he says to Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruling staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. Shiloh. Who is this Shiloh, this descendant of Judah? Well, perhaps you are familiar with the Jewish greeting of peace. It is Shalom. And this man named Shiloh is the man of peace. He is descendant from Judah. He is the Christ, the Messiah. He is indeed the one who gives the ultimate Shalom, peace. And we can talk about many other prophecies of the Savior, but you're probably familiar with the one that's frequently quoted in relation to his birth. Isaiah predicted the birth of the Messiah, the Savior. And he said these words in his ninth chapter, some 700 years before the Christ would be born. He said, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. <coughs> And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And how does the rest of it go? The Prince of Peace. There's going to be one born, and Isaiah speaks of it with such certainty as he does in his 53rd chapter about the death and resurrection of the coming Savior. He speaks with such certainty that he often uses the past tense. Yes, the child would be born, and this child would be called the Prince of Peace. Very often in the Old Testament, he is called the Prince. 
How appropriate. He is the son of the father. The father, God the father is the king and the prince would come. Yes, he is the prince of peace. And when that prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled, you recall that the shepherds got to hear a little bit of the angelic chorus. The angels say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Peace. There's peace associated with this baby in Bethlehem. He is that long-awaited Shiloh. He is the one predicted by Isaiah, the Prince of Peace. And now he's here. But it's not by virtue of his birth that he brings peace. And Jesus would talk about this peace. He would say, for instance, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be afraid. Jesus gives peace not in the worldly sense. You and I see peacelessness certainly in our families at times, in our congregation at times, in our nation at times, and between the nations of the world. And how desperately we want peace in these things. And that will come. That will come when Christ returns. But he did not come to bring that kind of peace yet. He came to bring a greater peace. Jesus would say in John chapter 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. And then he says, in the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good courage. I have overcome the world. Jesus says that in him, in his very person, as the eternal Son of God, and as God made man, made flesh for us, in him, and it's in him alone, that we find true peace. He then adds, yes, in the world, you will have tribulation. You're going to have in your families, in your church, sadly, in the nation, and in between different nations, you're going to have peacelessness. But the Savior says, I have overcome the world. And like Isaiah, Jesus speaks in the prophetic past tense. He speaks as if it's already done, that he has overcome the world. But no, it would not happen until that Easter Sunday. You see, Jesus speaks to his disciples in that locked room on the very evening of the day that he rose from the dead. And he says to the disciples, Peace be with you. Now what is this peace that he's talking about? Well, this peace he then explains by a wonderful illustration. What does it say? Right after he says, peace be with you, it says, he showed them his hands and his side. Literally, the verse connects it and says, when he had said this, in other words, when he said, peace be unto you, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. You see, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is showing the very source of peace. Looking at his hands, and Luke tells us he also showed them his feet, they are seeing the very marks of the crucifixion. The marks of the one who died in our place. Jesus had predicted in Matthew's Gospel, for instance, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. He came to give his life, and when they look at those nail prints in his hands and his feet, they realize this is the one who has done what he said he would. He gave his life. And how did they know he was dead when he hung upon that cross? 
Well, the Roman soldier, you remember, who was assigned to guarantee the death of those who were crucified, he went to those on Jesus' right and left, and he broke their legs so that ultimately they would suffocate, being unable to push up with their feet and breathe. But when he came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, he had to make sure. So he took his lance, and being a professional killer, he's a Roman soldier, he thrust his lance into the side of Jesus, thus piercing the very heart of our Savior. Yes, when they looked at the side of Jesus, they saw the guarantee that he was dead. They saw the guarantee that he had paid the ransom. They saw the guarantee that their sins were paid for. The Apostle Peter would say, he bore our sins in his body on the cross. And now the disciples are seeing that very peace. Ah, we are forgiven for the times when we spoke evil, for the times when we thought evil thoughts, for the times when we ran away when we should have stayed, for the times when we did wrong things. Ah, he has paid for all of those sins. And as John would write in our epistle reading, he, that is Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He's the propitiation. He is the atoning sacrifice. And his death guarantees the forgiveness of sins. But wait a minute. If he's dead, why is he standing there? This is the other aspect of peace, the second aspect. And that is that this dead man is alive. This dead man is risen from the dead. And he promised, because I live, you shall live also. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And why is that? It is because he is risen from the dead. As a pastor, I officiated about 150 funerals. And every time, it caused a tear to come to my eye as I realized that, yes, these people have died. But I got to proclaim, He is risen. And in Christ, we too shall rise. Now there's one additional aspect of the peace that Jesus gives, and that is his presence. He is standing there in the locked room, and the disciples realize he's with us. Is he here today? Most certainly. We don't get to see him with our eyeballs like the apostles did, but Jesus said, wherever two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And when you and I leave our, and go our separate ways, he's with us. He said in connection with baptism, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with us. So forgiveness, resurrection from the dead, and life everlasting, and his presence with us in this fallen, sinful world. These are the peace that he comes to give. But he only spoke to the apostles there. He spoke to them, and they were the ones who got the peace. But is that it? No. Jesus then says a second time, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. The apostles were uniquely sent. The Jews had a word for this. It was called shayach. And it meant someone so official that when they spoke, it was the equivalent of the person sending them speaking. Thus, when the apostles spoke, when they wrote, when they shared the good news, it was Jesus speaking. And they are very unique witnesses of these things. In our epistle reading, which we heard read a moment ago from 1 John, written by the apostle John, bear in mind that in this epistle reading, as is the case in so many other places of the New Testament, the words we and us are not referring to you and me. 
They're referring to the apostles. And so what did the apostles get to do? We read, that which was from the beginning, which we, we apostles, have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life that was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. You see, you and I get to have fellowship with the apostles. And then John continues, and indeed our fellowship, the apostles' fellowship, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Now keep that last thought in mind. We are writing these things. And so it is that the apostles received the peace. But then Jesus continues to describe how they get to distribute it. He says, first of all, it says he breathed on them. and says, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the wondrous privilege that the apostles have to distribute the peace of Jesus. And it is a privilege that is carried on in the church and is officially acted upon by pastors whom Jesus has established to lead the church. And so the words, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, that's the absolution. We're not just assuring people of forgiveness, we're actually telling them, I forgive you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this forgiveness is given and is pronounced whenever there's a baptism, whenever there's the Lord's Supper, and whenever the pastor says, I forgive you. The pastor is simply continuing in the apostolic privilege. Now your pastor, nor this guy who's the district president, we're nothing special. We are simply a mouthpiece. And we get to speak on behalf of Christ as the apostles did. The apostles were the first ones to distribute this peace. Have you ever wondered why at a baptism the pastor says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? It is because he is acting on behalf of Christ as the apostles were. The apostles died, but their work needed to continue. So there is the establishment of the pastoral fathers. What a joy it is to distribute forgiveness of sins. But there are some who are upset with the second half of this. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 16 and in Matthew 18, and now he's officially given, given what we call the office of the keys. If someone persists in open and unrepentant sin, the pastor is to tell such a person, you should not come to the Lord's Supper. <gasps> Isn't that mean? It's actually quite loving. You see, Jesus gave this additional command because if someone strays away into this public, unrepentant sin, the desire of the church is to have that person repent and return and receive the body and blood of Jesus in the Lord's Supper. It's not a mean thing at all. It's a loving thing. When someone strays away from the faith, we don't want them to go to hell. We don't want them separated from God forever. And so we lovingly tell them, you may not come to the table until you repent. And our catechism speaks about this. If you've memorized the catechism, I'm sorry, I memorized the old version. But the old version says, Jesus commands, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And the catechism asks the question, what do you believe according to these words? I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, now listen to this, especially when they exclude manifest and impenitent sinners from the Christian congregation. And again, when they absolve those who repent and are willing to amend, this is as valid and certain in heaven also as if Christ, our dear Lord, dealt with us himself. You see, to exclude manifest and impenitent sinners is an act of love. And so Jesus gives the apostles and then pastors who would follow them this second act of love. But let us now move to the third echo of peace. 
And that occurred when Jesus appeared to Thomas one week later. Now we call Thomas very often Doubting Thomas. How unfortunate that is the case. Because we could each slip our name in there. I'm Doubting Dan. This is Doubting Jason over here. Doubting Jonah. Now put your name in there. Do we not have our doubts? Do we not at times wonder? Now Thomas, one of the apostles, said, unless I put my fingers in the marks of his nails, and unless I thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And Jesus came then one week later, and Thomas was there in the locked room, and now Jesus again says to Thomas, peace be with you. You see, Jesus says to doubters like you and me and Thomas, peace be with you. And he says to Thomas, reach here your fingers into the marks of the nails, thrust your hand into my side, and be not doubting, but believing. You might say, wait a minute, Master Brady, we don't get to do that. That's true. The apostles got to see and handle and touch. You remember that reading from 1 John there. We don't get to do that, but we have something that Thomas didn't have. We have the writings of the apostles. Remember I told you to hang on to that last sentence that I read there from 1 John? John would say, and we are writing these things. We, we apostles are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. We are writing these things. And thus our gospel ends with these words. These things are written so that you may believe. These things are written so that you can touch the nail prints with your fingers so that you can thrust your hand into his side because we have the absolutely certain inspired word of the apostles. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life, that is eternal life, of course, in his name. So you see, here is the Prince of Peace standing there. But he's here today. As you and I heard the absolution from Pastor Reed, Jesus was here. As you and I partake of his body and blood, given and shed for the forgiveness of our sins, Jesus is here. And what's he doing? Doing the same thing that he did that Easter Sunday, and then a week later, he is giving us peace. He is giving the peace of the forgiveness of our sins, the peace of the promise of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, and the peace of realizing that he is present, and I might add, the peace that comes to us through the written word, that you and I are privileged to read, mark, learn, and to hear being preached every single Sunday. What a joy it is to know this peace from Shiloh, the one descended from Judah. In his holy name, Amen. Amen. Let us now stand as we confess our sins, or confess our faith, I should say, uh, in the words of the Nicene Creed.
Christ as your Son, you adopt all who believe in Him. Receive us as your newborn children, and nourish our faith by the pure, by the pure spiritual milk of your Word, that we may dwell in your presence forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, who have declared peace between God and man in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, receive our thanks for the authority given to your church on earth, and grant that the ministers of your church will faithfully carry out their office and pronounce the free forgiveness of sins upon all repentant sinners. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, as your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior, grant that we would share that life and love with those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your peace flows from the risen and glorified wounds of Christ through your church and into the lives of all your faithful people. Bless and direct Christian parents that your forgiveness would be freely shared in their homes and that each man would live together in your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, who appoint rulers and officials for the sake of order and peace, bless those who have placed an authority over us in federal, state, and local governments. Give to them the desire to serve with integrity and honor, and to work for the benefit of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we praise your Son's resurrection from the dead and draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Graciously receive our prayers of intercession and hear them for his sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, the word of life was made flesh and suffered death and is risen in victory. Give us his very body and blood and the bread and wine that we may have the forgiveness of sins and fellowship with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your indescribable grace and for the sake of your Son, you have given us the Holy Gospel and institu instituted the Holy Sacraments, that through them we may have comfort and the forgiveness of sin. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may heartily believe your word, and through the Holy Sacraments, establish our faith day by day, until at last we obtain eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
And by his Christ we again he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we love and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
in this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us in the same, in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
It's too late to get a dollar for that now. Jonah, what should, we should ask President Brady. President Brady, after service, every service, when he remembers, the pastor offers a dollar of his own money to any of the kids who can answer any question that I should throw out their way before the beginning of the next service. What should I ask them this week and put my own money on the line to have them research? Does it have to do with the sermon that was preached today? No, just oh. in general. Okay. All right. An Easter question would probably be a good one. All right. Well, I'm going to have it deal with today's sermon. That's the children. What did Jesus say three times? Oh, on Sunday of Easter and great Sunday of question. Right. Exceptional. Even my own children should be able to answer this. <laughs> uh, I don't know. He's like, wait, you're asking a question? What? What was said three times by Jesus to the apostles between the two days that he appeared to them after his resurrection? <laughs> Great question. So tell me before service next week, and you win a dollar coin of pastor's money. Uh, I'll probably be out of touch on Tuesday, so if you're looking for me Tuesday, call my cell phone. I certainly won't be in the office. Any other announcements before we go about our way. Well, ask you to please give us a few minutes to divest before we uh, come up for the meeting, but uh, we should be up there right quick. Nothing else? Depart with the Lord's peace. We'll see you all again soon.